Ros Picard. So emotions, robots, and AI are usually separate fields, but not in her mind. She's the creator of the term effective computing, which uses AI to interpret emotions. She may be creating the sensors that enable you to enter the matrix. And in the nest of creative media lab uh, geniuses, she's a superstar. Thanks, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. In addition to being a full professor here, uh, full disclosure, I've co-founded two companies, Affectiva and Empatica, and one of them's technology is being used in today's talk. How many of you check the weather forecast on your phone? I'm just curious. All right, what if, now 150 years ago it was nuts to talk about forecasting weather, especially in a place like Boston where it could be sunny one day and 10 inches of snow the next. I'm gonna talk about something that may seem kind of just as nutty, but I hope to convince you that we can do this. The forecast I dream of is to look at my phone and get my stress, mood, and health for tomorrow. Am I getting sick or am I gonna stay well? Now, we have to be careful about this Around here with this busy crowd uh, and our intense schedules, you might look at the forecast and see something like this, right? Oh my gosh, stress tomorrow, higher, worse mood, I'm gonna get sick, or a higher chance. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I wanna look at that forecast, right? That would be an app that would probably fail. Like, who wants this? But suppose that we could not only forecast it accurately, but we could also enable you to see another realistic forecast based on evidence of your behavior and your personal measures uh, that could allow you to make behavior changes and have a better outcome tomorrow. You don't have to use it, like my husband won't, you know, it's raining, he's still not gonna take an umbrella. <laughs> but, but I would think this would be tremendous for people like me who often uh, wind up with subtle mood changes without awareness of what it is that's making them happen. That would be an amazing opportunity to change tomorrow. Now I'm gonna drill down into just a piece of this and I'm gonna apologize right here because I think this is a pretty happy day but here's a super depressing slide. The slide though has important statistics that are just a subset of what's going on that everybody here needs to know about because it's so important that we work together to change this. The first numbers have to do with the CDC's 15-year study showing huge increases in suicide. And the updated numbers are continuing to show a horrible trend, especially among young people and uh, people over, over 50. This is not just a problem in the United States, although it's a huge problem in the United States. The World Health Organization has done a very fat report, country by country, listing the statistics, and they forecast in 2014 that by next year there'll be a suicide every 20 seconds. And by 2030, the forecast is that the lives lived, the years lived with disability and the lives lost will exceed those of all cancers, war, stroke, and accidents. Now, I don't know about you, but I would, I, I think we might be able to try to get some interest in preventing that forecast from happening. It's not a fait accompli, it's something still projected. When we measure hundreds of things, and I build a concept diagram from them of how well you're doing, here, higher on this graph is a bunch of measures rolled up into, hey, you're doing great, left to right is time, and let's say that you get into your favorite school or you get your favorite job or your favorite investors at the table or whatever, um, your well-being goes up over time, nice little bump up in the blue and the red there. But as people encounter major stressors, almost everybody takes a bit of a dive in well-being. What we're interested in is what are the objective measures we can make that let you know early if you're on that red line or that blue line and not wait until your red line goes down low enough that you, you wind up in the medical system with a depression diagnosis. 
my story of why I think we can do this, uh, I'm going to give you the super short version of it here. I was really honored to have the 15-minute version just appear on TED.com a couple weeks ago, a more in in entertaining 15-minute version there. But the short version for this morning's uh, less than 10-minute slot is we started working with children with autism. Here's a boy who looks stressed outwardly and indeed is stressed inwardly. We started by just trying to measure stress. We began by measuring a lot of things, one of which was the electrodermal activity. The, you may know when the sympathetic nervous system fight or flight response happens, it involves lots of brain regions uh, which innervate just about every organ in the body. And one of the organs that gets the pure sympathetic nervous system response is the skin. So at first we thought this was a simple sweat response with nervousness, uh, but it turns out to be much more interesting than that. We built devices to leave the lab and start collecting this data 24-7 so we could help kids with autism in their natural school and home environments to be better understood. And here you see it on non-traditional places. Usually this is stuff measured on the palms for sweaty palms, but we started exploring more convenient locations because our kids couldn't wear it on their palms all day. To our surprise, we found a unusually large response on only one wrist, not on both wrists, when one of the children with autism also had a grand mal seizure. Long story short, lots more uh, studies with people with epilepsy and at Children's Hospital Boston, and working with Empatica to commercialize uh, the findings. We took the electrodermal activity, the movement activity, and combined it with AI, machine learning, and lots of data to build the world's first smartwatch that's enabled by real-time AI to detect uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures and alert to those in a way that may be potentially life-saving. And here's just one of many peer-reviewed publications that uh, goes through some of that data, trying to optimize detection while minimizing false alarm rate. I'm pleased to say that this, I'm told this was the first smartwatch uh, running AI to get FDA cleared in neurology. Now, we're here about the brain today, and I'm talking about the skin. Well, one of the many surprising findings we learned has to do with how brain activity, as measured traditionally by neurologists on the scalp with the EEG, actually goes flat. It looks like your brain is dead when these certain events happen related to seizures that cause the skin conductance to go up enormously on the wrist. I don't know about you, but this, this was a total head scratcher for me. I had to pull Ed Boyden aside to say, like, what's going on here? Uh, there's been a lot more research on this lately. And by the way, this is published in the top journal Neurology. It's been replicated in other groups. Uh, but one thing we learned is that these connections deep in the brain can have, especially the regions involved in emotion, memory, and attention, can be super activated in such a way that the stuff people are usually measuring on the surface shows nothing, and yet different patches of skin can show very significant responses. So we're now in the process of trying to do much more careful science, looking at this not as a generalized sweat response, but understanding more what, was, what people in Medicine 101 learned, is that we have these three kinds of tissue. One of them, the ectoderm, knit together our brain, our spinal cord, and our skin from the moment we were formed. We're starting to make those mappings. An example of where this can change the future is in this work here that was done at the MIT Media Lab where, uh, in partnership with Mass General Hospital, where what you see vertically is uh, a score that we developed with machine learning led by Asma Gandharian in my lab uh, using uh, an Empatica smartwatch, uh, the participant's smartphone, information on the smartphone that includes their movement activity, their GPS, their social interaction, and sleep data gathered from both of those. Uh, the AI predicts your Hamilton Depression Rating Scale score, which is the gold standard among psychiatrists for are you depressed or not. Uh, and the horizontal axis is the rating that the doctor gave. And what we see here is a correlation, even in our first subset, of greater than 0.8. This is better than the doctors are with each other. Uh, since then, we've been getting even more data, and the correlation has continued to go up. Last I saw, it was above 0.9. NIH has just awarded our big team effort with Mass General Hospital uh, funding to expand this to a larger group. We'd like to do an even larger group. 
uh, where we could actually subtype different kinds of depression uh, and people getting better and, well, hopefully more people getting better. Uh, MIT J Clinic, a competitive uh, funding here at, the, at MIT among just MIT participants, also chose us as one of their top awards for extending the machine learning on this work. We are also uh, continuing to take the machine learning and personalize it and enable you to benefit from it. Now, we're not ready to release this because we, we have to do something else important that I want to tell you about that's a super huge challenge. But even in the initial study here with hundreds of New England college students, we were able to show 78 to 87% accuracy. And this is taking your data today and over recent uh, days and using it to forecast if tomorrow night you're likely to be in a better mood, happy, sad, you're likely to be healthy or sick, physical health, and uh, your stress level, which and all of these interact, which is why we're doing them together. It turns out actually oddly be easier to make the problem, make the problem harder and do all three. It actually improves the recognition accuracy of each of them. I wish to recognize my superstar PhD student collaborators on this. Uh, here's just a picture from, um, we were recognized with the best paper prize at the top machine learning conference. And I also should maybe just point out and apologize that we have a little bit of a lack of diversity in our group. <laughs> although, we do come, <laughs> although we do come from uh, three continents and four countries. Now, Ahino Sakari, who was on the right of that previous slide, has devoted her whole PhD to a very important other piece of this. Again, it's not enough to forecast, okay? We think forecast because the weather, that's all we can do, right? We can forecast that there's gonna be snow or rain or hopefully some sun here eventually. Uh, but we can't do anything about the weather yet, right? I know people are working on it, but we can't do anything about it. But what about your personal mood, stress, and health? We think you could do something about it. We think you could change tomorrow's weather forecast. But we wanna, you know, we're MIT, we wanna do this in a really solid evidence-based way, not some crazy uh, horoscopy silliness. So what we've been doing is trying to learn from your wearable and smartphone data what it is you're doing that is associated with you doing better tomorrow or worse. I'll just give you one example here from Ehi's thesis where she found in the data for this group of New England University students that taking time for a little positive social interaction the night before and for the, you could tell these are students getting to bed before 1 a.m., <laughs> was uh, significantly associated with tomorrow's stress being significantly lower, which is a huge factor in mental health and well-being. So my final slide, I just want to say we are building the way with AI and machine learning to, and wearable sensors and super smartphone apps to enable each person here to see if you're on that red line or blue line. And our goal is to see if we can not only help people get better when they're not doing well, but if we could actually prevent 80% of the cases of depression that are happening and change that forecast for the year 2030. Thank you, and I hope you'll come talk to us during lunch. And the CEO from Empatica is here also.